about how we broke the industry, each of us, and then we will take questions because one of the things we don't know is what you guys want to know, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So this is breaking into the industry. We'll start down there with Amanda. Hello, everybody. I am Amanda Hamlin. I am a senior designer in the D&D studio at Wizards of the Coast. I broke into the tabletop industry, oh goodness, about 15 years ago now. Um, and it was basically because I was a newspaper journalist who was very unhappy with my job and I had editing skills and I had been playing D&D since I was 16 years old and I had gone to Gen Con. It was a yearly trip that my friends and I all made. I decided I was gonna start passing out my business cards to uh, people at publishing companies asking if there was any freelance editing work. And that is what bore the fruit that then led to several full-time jobs in the industry, lots of freelance work, and now, now this. That's a very short version. <laughs> I'm Crystal Mazer. I'm a freelance writer and game developer. I'm also an educator by day, and that's actually how I got wrangled into this. I do workshops for teachers on how to use comic books and games as educational materials. Um, and my best friend who had been in the industry had been trying to get me to write for years, trying to get me to write, trying to get me to write. And I did a workshop on role-playing games specifically and early education, which is, if you don't know early education, it's like second grade and lower, um, and how role-playing works in that. And he was like, hey, you're gonna write a Halloween kids scenario using um, First Fable, which is an open game license. And so I did, and I based it off of the poem slash scary story of there was a dark, dark house in a dark, dark corner. Um, and the entire thing is going through that dark, dark house <laughs> and what it looks like from a kid's perspective. Um, and from there, um, the person who did the layout was Aloy Lacenta. If you don't know him, he is amazing, and you should get to know him. He is the owner of Third Eye Games, and he asked me to write on the PIP System core book, which was my first huge writing um, block that I ever did, and it ended up winning an Any in 2018. So that kind of skyrocketed from there. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Andrew Isigaska. I'm the writer of the award-winning Alien role-playing game. Um, I've written a few Planet Apes novels and some other properties, Choose Your Own Adventure. Um, mine is weird, but I guess most people's story is weird. Um, <laughs> all different, yeah. Not I, went, I went to, I went, I, I thought I was gonna be an artist. I went to the School of Visual Arts to be in comics. Uh, I had a writing instructor, Denny O'Neill, who was in charge of Batman over at DC at yeah. the time. Uh, he told me that I was wasting my time with art because I was a better writer basically mentored me to be a writer um, that led to the Planet Apes novels, which led to a relationship with 20th Century Studios, which led to me doing the Predator Bible internally for them, and then them saying, if I can find a publisher who wants to do anything that in a category that we don't have already, they know I know the material for Alien, Predator, and Planet Apes, so they would recommend me as a writer. I found Free League for Alien, and here we are. And I, w I was a gamer for 20 something years before this so i just thought that that was going to be my hobby and then i retired the hobby didn't realize that was going to be a huge part of my career hey everybody i'm teos abadia you can find me at alphastream.org and i have a youtube channel that has a section of it which is called success in rpgs which is about this kind of topic so it may be helpful to you check it out if you want uh, i would never have imagined my path when i learned D, &D in columbia south america but it was wild and crazy and i played a lot and I found organized play and i started volunteering and spending my time helping the folks in organized play and then they gave me things to do and year after year i wrote more and created more and then somebody said hey would you like to write for wizards of the coast and i said that sounds pretty fun. <laughs> and then I, from there, I've done all kinds of things. I worked on the HeroQuest board game. I worked with Penny Arcade and Dwarven Forge and other really amazing names that I still pinch myself when I think about it, MCDM. Um, so it's great. And, and you never really feel, at least I don't feel, like I've ever really broken in. It's an active verb thing. Like you are always breaking in and there's been finding new things and growing and crossing. That's a good point. Uh, my name is Matt Forbeck. Uh, I've been doing this for 35 some years, ever since I was in high school, actually, uh, as a freelancer. And I've never had a full time job outside the gaming industry, which is kind of freaky. Um, but I started out when I, I grew up in Beloit, Wisconsin, just down the road here. Uh, my latest thing is the uh, Marvel role playing game, which just came out in August. Right? Uh, but I also was the president of Pinnacle Entertainment Group and did Brave New World, a bunch of other games over the years, uh, Lord of the Rings role playing game, et cetera, et cetera. 
I usually do um, comic books, uh, video games, novels, things like that these days as opposed to doing tabletop role playing games. But um, I started out uh, growing up in southern Wisconsin and going to conventions here. So my first convention was a winter fantasy in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin at the American Legion Hall where I met Gary. And I worked for Gary as a freelancer when I was in college, actually. But I remember my mom uh, talked to this guy and said, yeah, this is the worst goddamn convention I've ever been to. You know, I mean, she, she was in the city council. She'd been in all these different conventions all over the country. She's like, this is just terrible. And she, I'm like, oh my God, mom, that's very fine. That's what the hell are you doing? Um, uh, so I had a little mini magazine I started. I had my own booth at Gen Con uh, the summer I turned 17. And it went for like two whole issues before it went bankrupt and then I went off to college. Uh, but that got me in for doing writing and editing for other people. I was playtesting Pace Hunter games in Delaware, Wisconsin. Uh, when I was in high school, again, I'd do that after uh, after soccer practice. I'd drive up there and you know, uh, play games with those guys, Troy Denning, and, uh, Steve Sullivan, and Kelly Sanchez, and Andre Ade, et cetera. Uh, and I actually broke in mostly by doing editing, because no, nobody wants to edit, right? Mm -hmm. So if you can do editing, they're like, I can, like, I can edit that for you. I'm like, well, <clears throat> and then eventually they're like, well, could you write that? The first products, I started working at TSR doing editing, and then they're like, uh, mm -hmm. We need somebody to develop this book called Chronomancer, uh, which they had just bought from Maker Games as part of the deal to uh, the lawsuit they had over Roll Aids, uh, where they were trying to sue people who were doing D&D &D supplements. And they said, well, we have this book that's not really well done yet. Can you develop this? And that was my first development. And then they started giving me full books to do. So I ended up writing a lot of stuff in the second edition, third edition, et cetera. Hi, I'm Tommy. Uh, I'm mainly a uh, tabletop board game designer. Uh, I started my path uh, in film. I was working in the film industry in Toronto, developing television and whatnot. And uh, of course, uh, my path was all, every independent filmmaker's path that starts off as a horror. And it took me uh, many, many years to break out of horror, get into fantasy and comedy and the more difficult genres. And uh, I started picking up board games. Now, let me overarch this thing. I've been playing D&D this entire time, but I wasn't really a board gamer, so. <clears throat> We got into board gaming and uh, I was making a uh, offhanded joke about how uh, now my new hobby of board gaming is into horror because we were playing Arkham Horror and mm -hmm. Trail of the House of Haunted Hill as our regular go-to games. And uh, my colleague said, well, if, you know, you're, you're a bit of an entrepreneur, if you're, you're a hot shot, go, go make your own game then if you don't want to play horror games. And so well, I did. And so I went and made a, a fantasy game. And, uh, and then because my skills in, in the industry uh, led me to being able to do pretty much every hack that goes into a game, from graphics to writing to whatever, I, uh, I just kept going with it, and going with it, and going with it, and then I, I cursed my life by putting it on Kickstarter. <laughs> lost a shit ton of money. And then, uh, and then but the point was is that uh, at the time, in 2014, uh, you know, it, it did fairly well for what it was, for a no-name, and, and then I, I had the school of hard knocks to figure out what it was, what you should and shouldn't do in the gaming industry. So I really broke into it by breaking my face along the coals. Uh, but from that point on, um, uh, the, the game was 100% effective and I had to make some decisions and instead of what a lot of Kickstarter uh, runners do where they just say, too bad, and they show you a picture of them eating a hot dog somewhere, I, uh, I, I decided to repay for the entire run on like, the you know, artist's wage. And so uh, that update uh, triggered a few people in the industry who then started to say, hey, look, if you care about that, you should do this. And then I got the Buffy license. So I worked on, I did the Buffy the Vampire Slayer game, and then that snowballed into everything I work on today, which is uh, Doctor Who from Gale Force 9. We work with Catalyst. I'm now working designing uh, the AI system for Battletech. So you can play uh, uh, Battletech solo, which is uh, no small feat. We did uh, Star Trek Alliance for the attacking system, and we're kind of getting known as uh, as like the uh, the guys who are creating cooperative and solo play games. This is what we're turning into, and we think that's because we're Canadian. But because uh, <laughs> the one American on our team keeps trying to put in the, the semi co-op or the or the competitive games we do. Uh, we work professionally with PAX to create the PAX games. There's a whole series of, uh, of PAX board games coming out that we designed with an audience. And then I got into streaming, which is why I'm here, because uh, uh, Peter Atkinson needed someone to film Matt Karoka here two years ago, um, because Matt had tore his Achilles. They invited me in, I came here, and I met an army of amazing people. Uh, and I started getting into more role playing design and publishing, and now I am. Uh, we were talking about breaking in, and this might be a good segue. Right. Uh, we were talking about breaking into the industry, and I, in the film industry, we have this thing called the prison break, where every independent filmmaker, the prison breaks to the next level. 
Um, it's, and then everybody else from the next little gener film generation tries to copy that prison break. And if you know anything about prison breaks, once you break out one particular way, no one's ever breaking out that way again because that, they seal that up real hard. So in this industry, there's multiple levels of breaking in for me. And uh, I, beginning, never really saw what other people did. So I did my own kind of break, which is I think why I got to my point. But it was a long, hard gruel. I would take the spoon and then scooping out the hole and then covering it every day in the cell when the guards aren't looking. And it's a heavy grind. You lose a lot of money sometimes. You make a lot of bad decisions. You meet some great people. But to keep your head up, it works. And stage one for me was breaking in financially, just being like, can I make a living off of this? And then stage two was, and I accept it. And then when you come into a room and people that, uh, that have done amazing things in the industry go, hey, good to see you. And they give you a handshake or they, they recognize you. To me, that's a mental break that I've kind of broken into the industry that I'm, 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 I'm part of the family now. And so those are two amazing checks, milestones to break into the industry for me, so. Yeah. Totally agree. That second one was game hole two years ago for me. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> I came here and I'm, like I'm online show. at the food truck and people are looking around me to see my badge. And then the next thing, someone's bringing a book up to me, sign online to the food truck. And I'm like, you it's guys know so me this well? It's so weird. Right? Yeah. I didn't even know me that well. I had like three <laughs> random people that I never story told for, told for or anything like that come up to me like, oh, we love your work. You do such amazing work. And I'm like, I'm being perceived. Oh, my goodness. What is going on? <laughs> That's crazy. Wow. So. Okay. It's funny, though, because I mean, you're famous here for like, while you're here at the show, mm -hmm. yeah. Probably, right? but you walk out there, nobody knows who you are. Yeah. Yep, <laughs> it's pretty great, honestly. Right? My yeah. student, my students are like, "Are you famous?" I'm like, "Not in the way that you think." <laughs> in a very way. First, uh, we have can a bunch of so one more thing on this fame thing. One sure. thing that's really interesting, you know, and we talk about editors. So, folks who tend to have their names on covers are the folks that tend to get recognized. Yeah. But there's this whole industry behind those front names yeah. that often isn't recognized. And one of the coolest things I ever saw was a good friend of mine, Scott Fitzgerald Gray, who's mm -hmm. edited a lot of the D&D stuff and many yeah. other wonderful mm -hmm. things, and is a writer and super talented at everything. And Penny Arcade had us sit at the table in the same room with all the Penny Arcade folks who were signing the Acquisitions Incorporated hardback book. And he just talked about later, you like how incredible that was. Yeah. As an editor and project manager mm -hmm. to be recognized in a way that you usually never are in the industry, which is really cool. So there is that, but sometimes if you're working a certain way, you kind of may never get a lot of fame. You may know people mm -hmm. and, and kind of have a bar kind of thing, but people will not stop you and ask to sign the book, unfortunately. When they should, because you're one of the most critical people there. Yeah. Doesn't get out the door without you. One of, one of the most helpful things for you guys to do is if you're looking to try to follow people or look to like bodies of work, open that page and look at who all wrote on mm. the project and look who edited the project look at the and look at the layout person yeah. oh and look <laughs> because <laughs> layout is the bane of my existence. Editors and layout. <laughs> but the editor is the person who will hire. Well, hire. <laughs> Yep. Right, so look at those editors. <clears throat> and a lot of companies they have different editors. They have some editors who will be the, they'll do uh, copywriting they'll, or proofreading, etc. And then they'll have acquisitions editors. Like mm -hmm. back in the day at TSR, it was Bruce Hurd was the guy who hired everybody for anything. So I always knew I would call up Bruce. This is actually before email. We'd have to call up Bruce and say, hey, Bruce, what are you guys doing the schedule for this year? He's like, ah, it's going to be in three weeks. I'd write it down on my calendar, call him up in three weeks. Bruce, you get the schedule done? Because I knew they, were, they would give out all the work mm -hmm. the week after the schedule was done. So you just had to know when that happened. And yep. He was the guy you had to talk. Mm -hmm. He was the guy who did Mistara for many years, too. He's a great yep. writer. Yep. Fantastic guy. So do you guys have questions up? We could ramble for hours. Yeah. We're gamers and you know, drink and know things. So. Well, while you think of a question, there I was thinking that uh, touching back on the uh, being an editor or being hearing the world <coughs> in the industry are or where the easier breaks are, uh, there's a secondary part, part to that, which is you have to be very self-conscious, like a first date. You also have to be kind of good. You have, to, yeah. you have to be able to know what you're doing because if you go into that position and say, I'm an editor, and someone gives you that chance, and you really aren't, yes. or, you, or you are, but you're not mm -hmm. like, as good as you think, um, you have to have that like that breath check before you go on the first date because that first date just means a lot. Yeah. If you mess that up, it is a small industry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> you know, it's a lot of person, No, 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 they missed everything in my book. You gotta, so you gotta be very careful and just be like honest with yourself. 
mm -hmm. uh, and to recognize the fact, like, look, I'm not an editor. I cannot spell my way out of uh, grade two classroom. It's, it's horrible. <laughs> when, it, when I did all the English classes in, 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 in high school and, and, and they were all trying to teach me things, I was designing my role playing game and then published. I was not paying attention to any grammar. But <laughs> luckily for me, there are people who would love to do that for me, yep, yep. and that's great. But just make sure, and I've hired people like this where I've made these mistakes and saw those defects, and like, oh my god. So you gotta be very, very careful. So just be honest with yourself, and if you're not the person that breaks in that industry, focus on what you love and focus on what you're good at as well, and hopefully that, that cognitive dis dissonance will align and you will do what you love. Right? And you, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I was gonna say, um, why don't we quick get to know our audience real quick? Yeah. How many of you have actually published anything? Nice. How many of you have done it through community content? Like DMs Guilds. Like DMs Guild or anything yeah. like that. Okay. Itch.io, yes, or Itch.io. Oh. Itch.io. Um, Itch.io. <laughs> or um, how many of you have no clue how to get into the industry and are here for that? Yeah. Okay, right. cool. How many, how many of you are looking at writing? How many of you are looking at editing? And how many of you are breathing right now? <laughs> and then how many of you are layout or artists okay cool That's then cool. then we can tailor stuff to you guys as far as when we answer questions yeah um i think community content is actually a huge thing and something because like pip system has its own community content it's called pip world um there isn't a lot of stuff on there but i actually as the line developer for pip system look at the people who publish stuff and i have reached out to them to write on pip stuff so you can get your name out there through that not every single community content is going to do that but there are a lot of them that do and there are a lot of uh, developers who keep their eye on that stuff especially like dms guild or storyteller vault i do it with pip world um where you're like wow if this went out on dms guild and it's a breakthrough thing and it skyrockets that's a possibility of working on things like like third party licensing products or even at some point watsy who knows um uh, so <laughs> everybody's got to something for watsy once sit there it's like i did something I, well and I, I think there's two parts to that one is one is that it's, it's really cool to, to write for the, the biggest companies out there. It is. It feels good, right? And, and one of the reasons we often want to create is because we want that feel good recognition, mm -hmm. whatever. I mean, it's a childless dream come true, that kind of thing. But also, they pay really well, yeah. right? If you look at their salaries, which they are uh, for, but for certain definitions of really well. Sure. Well, <laughs> yes. I mean, it may not be a large better than anybody else. Yeah. 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 Uh, so the funny thing with that is, yeah. like, I've seen. <clears throat> like a company that's like free league level pays more than a company that's on the higher level. It may, so, but yeah. in general, if you look, you know, some companies, and it's happening more and more, thank you, California, that you see the pay salary for a position. Mm -hmm. And like if you look at one of the open jobs for Wizards of the Coast right now, like the upper end of that job is a really nice over 100 grand a year job, mm -hmm. right? Which is awesome. That's what it should be. And Wizards of the Coast provides great benefits, as it yeah. should. There are other companies that do really great things. Monty Cook Games, right? Really cool. They don't hire all the time, but those staff that are in there get taken care of, right? That's really awesome. And some people pay the freelancers really well, and that's really awesome because the money part of it matters big time. Yeah. And so as you discover what you want to create, which I think is really important, you should also see what the reality is of what this industry pays. And there are so many really awesome people in this industry that at the end of their careers are relying on GoFundMe and don't have a great re retirement plan. Yeah. So that is a part of your planning that I encourage you to, to think through as you mm -hmm. contemplate the industry. And, and that's why I think it's important to have a good community yeah. of other people who are also freelancing. And you can meet those people through a variety of different channels. Twitter used to be a really good community, especially for D&D um, and D20 related content where there were lots of people just talking about the things that they were doing and promoting their work um, from various publishers. It's less good than it used to be, but there's still those discords out there. There's still um, groups of folks that you can meet at conventions in person if that's your thing. I, I really encourage people to do that because that's how you learn the back channel information about the different companies and the way they treat their people and the salaries that they pay and just people's general experiences. That kind of information is invaluable and you're, you're not gonna learn that just from like Googling the company's name. 
Yeah, it's very rare for somebody to write an article and say, this is all the things you need to know. But if you ask somebody your question directly, yeah. almost all of us are willing to share. And a lot of us have long histories in, for it different companies. Too. Yeah. It yep. a lot. So what, it does. what you're learning today, uh, if we were at this panel again next year, we'd probably have a, a, a little more to add to it. Addendum mm -hmm. A, don't do this. <laughs> but I mean, it, it's a, the industry changes based on, on how the world changes. Because if you look, look at the last 10 years, from the, the transitioning from like paperbacks and print to digital and, and the acceleration of that through the pandemic of how you know we, we jumped 10 years ahead, I think, than what we should have been speculation, obviously, of, of like how we went from like the online presence just exploded over the course of the pandemic, which would have taken them several more years of real life if we hadn't had that uh, accelerant hit our society. Uh, so there's a lot of changes to, to, to consider when you're Mm -hmm. stuff. And Kickstarter, right? I mean, one of the things is before, like, it kind of feels like it was just yesterday. As a designer, you felt like you could only work for a few companies and you had to break through that yep. wall <laughs> somehow to do this. And now you can do things your own, on your own. Mm -hmm. And you can see folks who are like, well, I started playing fifth edition two years ago and now I have a $400,000 Kickstarter. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, you know, I'm seriously. a little bit in over my head, but, you know, if I can figure this out, it'll mm -hmm. work for me. And, a little, yeah, a little bit Absolutely. over the head. My first Kickstarter, if it was any more successful than it was, it w I would have not. I would not be here today. I'm lucky that it wasn't as successful. <clears throat> and sometimes when you see these large Kickstarters, there are millions. Of people, oh, it's millions of. You know, they, you look. They, if, if they could break down the math behind the scenes, like sure. Look, if it's a 1.2 million dollar Kickstarter and they put 400 thousand in ads to get that because it looks cool, great. Start taking the money off manufacturer cuts. Oh, we profited 300 thousand dollars. Yay! But if you've got a staff and you got to uh, uh, make that money, something over the, you run out of money quick. So Kickstarters are kind of a delusion. If you're going to break into the industry trying to use a Kickstarter, just keep in mind that you need to build it for profit, you don't need to make it a million dollars, and you just kind of want to pulse, it's like a pulsed <coughs> income blast. You want to like use it to help you get to the next stage if, if creating your own projects and using that is another way you want to try and break into the industry. You can. So. Um, when was your moment of, you're doing your nine to five, you're doing this stuff, um, you know, you're writing, you're creating, you're editing and stuff, but when, is, when, do you, when did you decide to go, okay, I'm not going to have a safety net anymore, <laughs> and this is what I'm going to do for my living? Never. I can't yep. afford to do it full time. <clears throat> yeah. so yep. I'll, I'll say right now, like, uh, I, I have a, I'm fortunate to have a really good day job. I do environmental consulting <clears throat> in a weird niche area, and I have a daughter at Duke University. The tuition is $90,000 a year. <laughs> Oh. Um, I make enough money, fortunately, that I have to pay that. And there are two <laughs> models for college in America these days. There, you, you either pay all of it, or you're fortunately so poor that they pay it for you. There's not a lot in the middle. It's all yeah, ruinous yeah. in the right. middle. So yeah. I can't afford to ever quit. I also have a mortgage. I live in Portland, Oregon. It's become really expensive. So uh, no, yeah. I, I do things at night and in between the cracks of my family yep. time and stuff. Yeah. I was uh, I was 20 years old when I figured it out. Uh, but I was actually, I went to the University of Michigan, had a, was getting a degree in both creative writing and computer science, uh, was two different degrees at the same time, I was going to graduate in five years, and I figured, you know, I'd do the computer science at night and I'd write on the side, and, you know, evenings, weekends, whatever else, that's what my parents wanted me to do, like, this is the city, you can't be a writer, writers never make it up. Right? My dad said the same and thing. <laughs> and about, about two years in the program, I realized that, uh, I guess I was actually 19, so two years in the program, I realized I did that. I was never going to write because I was going to be, you know, I'd, get, I'd be tired at the end of the day, go see my girlfriend, go have a beer with my friends, play some games, right? So I ditched on that and got my creative writing degree in three years and said I'm going to jump in the deep end of the pool because I can do this while I'm young, have no obligations, you know, I can, I'm used to sleeping on floors at this point in my life, yeah. living on $4,000 a year or whatever the hell it is. <clears> and, uh, you know, and I figured if I fucked it up, I could always go back to school and finish off the, creative, the computer science degree. And here I am 35 years later and I haven't managed to go back, so it's, it's been good. But uh, I, I just had this crazy moment. My dad calls it my, mid, my quarter life crisis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, I think it's hard to make that transition. If you've got yeah. obligations, right, to be able to do that, there's no reason to jump over. I mean, a lot of stuff in this industry doesn't really need full timers, right? Mm -hmm. If you're setting up yourself as a business or if somebody's a big company wants to hire you, that's great. But mm -hmm. you don't really have to make it. You just do it as a hobby. Yeah. So I was, I was doing like my Planet of the Apes novels and graphic novels and stuff like that as a side to my 
day job, which was technically freelance, but it was like, you know, this is your, your freelance, freelance for us for the next year. It's a contract that, you know, it, and every year renewed. I did that uh, for Rockstar Games for 15 years. And they started changing the terms every year. So I was making less money for doing more work. Oh, and, yeah. Classic, yeah. classic. And I was, True. I was terrified. Where else am I going to get a job like this where I can, you know, I mean, it, so it was almost like being a doctor because they call you at three in the morning and say, we need this for 6 a.m. You know, so, all right, got to do it. I'd be on a cruise ship in the Caribbean on vacation. And I, yeah, I'm not getting off at this stuff because I'm going to be doing this work on the computer. But it still it was great money. But then the money was getting worse and worse and worse. And it was actually, I was uh, friends with Richard Hatch, uh, the actor who, uh, from Battlestar Galactica. And he, he passed away and his family asked me to speak at his memorials. And so I, I told them, I was like, I've worked for you for 15 years. I've never taken a vacation where I didn't do anything. I need the next three weeks off to do this stuff. And they're like, we know about your relationship with Richard. We saw that he passed away. That's fine, no problem. And then they proceeded to give me work every day while I was away. Oh. And so the first few days, I'm juggling this with funeral stuff and everything. And, and <coughs> my best friend's like, what are you doing? Just tell them no. Send them the email that they sent you that said it was OK. And I did that. And they're like, come to the office as soon as you get back in New York. So I'm like, worst case scenario, I get, um, I get just a, a good talking to. Best case scenario, I get let go with a severance, you know, and then somewhere in the middle, I just get let go. Um, now, because I'm freelance, they didn't have to owe me a severance, but it was 15 years, I knew where all the bodies were buried. So they gave me half a year severance. And I am so glad that I told them no, instead of being scared that I was not gonna get anything else, because I used that half a year severance to get my life together, wound up with a senior development editor job uh, that came out regular freelance writing work that then led to the gaming stuff. So, you know, it's, it's you, sometimes you gotta look at your life and say, okay, is this really so important that I stick with this as now? If you have got obligations like you guys are talking about, mm -hmm. it's a different story, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, but don't feel trapped where you are, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I got uh, four kids in college, basically, at this point in my life. We have, uh, yeah. my eldest is 24 years old, and he actually helped me write for the Marvel group. He's actually a freelance writer in all days, right? Then we had quadruplets 21 years ago. Yeah. Right, we're all 21, you know, so they're all 21, two of them in college, two of them kind of finding their way through. Yeah. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> What's the definition of Elvis strike when you're walking? Exactly. <laughs> 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 it's been a wild ride. Uh, so I think one of the things that comes out of your story too is to, you need to value yourself too. Mm -hmm. um, and that includes not working for free. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because even if you're in here, like I do this part-time. I'm a teacher. Um, my summers are spent writing. My evenings are usually spent writing. I don't also have kids, so it, that helps out <laughs> a lot. Um, but I still don't take um, writing jobs where they, they're going to pay me very little. Like yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, I, just, heck, I can just write this really quickly. No, no, because my actions still have impact on those that are trying to do this full-time yes. and are <clears throat> succeeding in doing this full-time or to those of you who are coming up behind all of us, because you guys are gonna be walking in our footsteps too. And so I try not to take, devalue myself and the work of myself and those who I mentor, because I, I do a freelance mentorship program. And I, so make sure that you are understanding your value. <laughs> that there is no set like, I'm worth this much for my writing and I'm worth this much for my editing. But it's the, well, I've been working here at this, this amount of pay, I probably should ask for more because I've been doing this now for two years. I've done four or five full projects for them from start to end and never had any issues. I could probably ask for a raise on that. Um, and I will say like, when it comes to that spectrum, um, there are several different types of pay. Usually it's per word when you're a freelancer. Mm -hmm. um, and I will tell you that the average is probably about six to eight. I have worked for stuff for four cents a word, but that's because I was really passionate about the project. Um, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes. Yep. Yeah. sometimes, sometimes I will take it lower. Yeah, and I was really passionate about the project, but at this point, if it's not 
anywhere like six cents or up, I will, I have to really be invested in that project in order for me to take it at that point. Yeah. I think it's a value so, judgment. Honestly, yes. like when I was doing, so I did freelance for several years before I got my first full-time job in gaming, which was at Paizo on Pathfinder first edition, um, in 2015. And so I got to a point after getting my first few assignments from several different companies and people knew who I was and I was getting offered work on a regular basis. I got to a point where there were companies that would pay at different levels. And um, for the most part, there were companies I didn't want to work with because I knew that they deliberately undervalued their freelancers. And there were companies that I felt like were, were good. I knew the people. I felt like they were doing important things and they were doing a good job taking care of their folks. And some of them were just smaller and just didn't make as much money and they could not afford to pay as much. Um, sometimes a company like that would uh, be spinning up a really big project that it paid a little bit less, but I felt like there would be very good um, exposure for me or there were people I really wanted to work with or that it would lead to something better down the road. And so I would take that as a, sort of an investment in hoping that it would you know, help me out in the long run. And so if you make those kind of decisions, I don't think you should feel bad about yourself. Right, right but also like sort of have kind of a general sense of how much you think you mm -hmm. need to make to make it worth your time. Yes. And it's also, oh, Sorry, oh exactly. it also depends <clears throat> if they seem like they're valuing you. Like, yeah. like yes. you, if they can't. How they treat you. For, for yeah. example, all right, I get a very high per word rate from the three companies I work the most for, okay? And I was approached at Gen Con by another company who said, oh, I, I love your work on Alien, would love to have you do this for us. They, they got back to me recently and said, okay, we offer this per word, okay? And it, it's maybe like half of what I normally get. So I said, well, I usually get this. Can you do any better than that? And they came back with something in between. Yeah. So they clearly want me. Yes. You know, yes. so. Places that's... will sometimes like, because I know there are places that pay premium because it's like, we want this person. Mm -hmm. This person is like going to help our company. And there's an aspect of pay it forward too. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to say that there's a bit of a classist system up there, but it's, I don't want to, so what I'm saying is not classist, but it's like, if you're, if we're in a, in a position of, as a publisher or whatever to be successful and we do our thing, and uh, you know maybe our intern or someone is doing something and and they need help on a project that they're doing on their own, and they ask me to do something for them, I'll I will reduce what I would cost to help them get uh, lifted off to the next market, as opposed to if you know a AAA were to walk up and say we'd like to bring you involved, bring you in, but we're only going to pay you this much. I'm like, I, I don't think so because the profits are there. And mm -hmm. Not that I'm saying you deserve more yeah. profits, I just think you're, you're devaluing me, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know. if, I, if I can add to that, there are companies that are out there that just say, look, we don't know how to be super successful. We can only pay you this, right? Yeah. Like, like this is what, it, yeah. we're trying to keep the lights on. We're a disaster. And I, <laughs> I, I appreciate that because you're, you're being real with me. You're yeah. Trying, yeah. It doesn't yeah. mean you don't value me you're in a tough place and haven't figured out how to do what other people are doing. You should, mm -hmm. but you haven't. And to just inject some math to it, um, if you want to make $60,000 a year before taxes, if you are paid 12 cents a word, you need to write 500,000 words this year. Yeah, that's a right? <laughs> There's basically, I know a few people can do that, but basically nobody. Um, if your average project is 20,000 words and you want to earn $50,000 a year, you need to have 21 projects in a year. Those are the kind of numbers that really hurt you, right? Yeah. And so most folks who have achieved some level of financial success, there's lots of kinds of success. And it's totally cool if you don't, if you just want to do like some neat projects during them, awesome, that's success, right? But, and there's a video where I cover this kind of math because it's really important to understand it and think through how you want to tackle this, right? Like it's cool to take the job from a company that means well but can't pay you well because you're gonna, be satisfied by that, right? But it's not going to put food on the table. It's not going to pay the bills, well, get your retirement. Nothing short of that packaged ramen, right? Yeah, the packaged ramen. I I use what I earned for freelancing and stuff to come to conventions. <clears throat> so, right. like, you know, it, it this is kind of like a cyclical thing. <laughs> how, so I was just say how I broke into the industry, uh, if you don't mind, uh, was that uh, the moment for me was I was working at a theater. And, and before I, I broke into my industry for film beforehand, I would recommend that if you're gonna have jobs that aren't career-based that you've gone to school for, if you just wanna work at work in a job somewhere, um, and just make a steady living, albeit whatever area you can afford, um, try to find some work that is in any way possible, and this might be some creative thinking, 
that requires you to sort of be synergistic with what it is you want to achieve. So mm -hmm. for example, for me, uh, I used to tell people back in the film days, if, if you want to be a filmmaker and you want to make movies and stuff like that, but you need to keep the lights on, and this is, I'm dating myself a bit here, go get a job at Blockbuster. I can go, <laughs> go work at the local uh, uh, video rental store because there you're watching the trends of movies coming in and out, you're reading the backs of every mm. movie, you're watching movies every day, you're so immersed in film that you are, and you're not getting paid like well, but you're so immersed in film that you get a chance to, so for me I worked in theater, and the moment that I had to make that decision was when uh, uh, my Blackberry, I was on my chest and I was falling asleep in the dark <clears> in the dark room before going into the theater and my manager was like, you need, you, your, your duties are being overshadowed <laughs> by your film life. Uh, you need to make a decision. And I'm like, uh, money. So I made the decision and I ended up sitting in this little studio that I'd got for myself, uh, staring all night at the wall being like, holy shit, I don't have a paycheck. I'm like, awesome. <laughs> and that was uh, 2007. And so it's, it's been a while since I've looked back then. And then of course I just hopscotch from one poor lily pad to the next, getting into gaming. Uh, it's been that whole start, <laughs> starting out the whole way through. Um, but uh, along the way, I just, uh, my, my moments of break, uh, my moments of, of realization that the nine to five isn't going to be my life anymore uh, was when I was going nine to nine. <laughs> I was 7 Eleven and I was just working nonstop any way possible to get anything that I need. So. so, talk about what Terrence was saying here. Uh, you're, you need to do the math and figure out what you're capable of producing in a day, right? Uh, on a regular basis. If you, if you start writing and you know, or editing or whatever, you say, I can do a thousand words a day or whatever. Then you can start figuring out what kind of money you need to have or what, if you're able to give it up. Uh, when I was start, when I was in my 20s <coughs> freelancing and I was doing only role playing game stuff, I was writing 5,000 words a day. Right? Well, right. Uh, and there's, there's right. me, think of Shane it. Hensley, and Steve Wan were the only three guys who were doing that kind of outfit, for instance. Right? But that meant we could be able to, when, when uh, TSR offered me a full time job. I'm like, I actually make more money freelancing than I would for you. Yeah. Why would I do that? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. right, that's, that's the thing, too. Yeah, yeah I, I had a company recently that was like, you know, well, we love what you're doing. We're going to keep doing stuff with you. And we're going to hire you full time and we're going to give you half the amount of money that we're going yeah, to do no. freelancing. <laughs> no, I'll still do freelancing. But sometimes, but sometimes, and I, I own a cafe and I've always in the, it seems to be in the driver's seat of like a lot of things that have teams that you're constantly having to, to juggle and balance. Um, and I'll tell you, this year, even though I had five cafes before the uh, pandemic, and I have been systematically shooting them all down, uh, <laughs> because the, the, the spinning the plates of that much, uh, while also designing games, while also making corporate film, while also having four children, while also, while also, also, also uh, people, I'm like, I've aged like 100 years in a year. <laughs> and it's like, and it's like um, at some point, uh, you, you need to simplify it. So if you're hunting constantly for the next gig, and you're getting paid really well, but the hunt is constant. Like, you start getting old, you start getting a little more fatigued. It's very, very and, tiring. And you just don't want to hunt anymore, mm -hmm. so sometimes you take a bit of a pay cut to find a secure job where somebody else is hunting for the money, yeah. and all you're doing is just doing, focusing on your job. And that is something nice about, you know, not switching away full time and not being on that amazing hunt is right. that you do get to have a little more mm -hmm. capability to say, I'll take this. And I won't take this. And it's really important to not, right? Not say yes to everything. Yeah. We would all say that. Um, and to pace yourself around what you can do and when. And then you can be a little, as you get better, the really nice thing that starts happening is you get to really be more choosy. And really mm -hmm. think through, like, like when you're really new, it's fine to take something on. Like, let's say you don't really love monster design, but someone needs that. And you're like, sure, I'll try it. And maybe you find you like it, or you go, no, that's really, mm -hmm. and actually it takes me a lot of time. Like, I am not 5,000 words a day. I'm the opposite. I outline, I think, I research. It's, you know, papers for weeks where I'm scribbling notes, and then I start writing. So I'm a very long process kind of writer. Um, I like my output, the final thing, but it takes a lot of work. So I can only take so many jobs. They have to pay well because I'm inefficient uh, and all of that kind of thing, right? So you want to learn that, what it is that makes you work and how to be happy. Who you are and what your patterns are, right? I always say when you're a freelancer too, you're talking about the hunt, you have three different jobs. You have to get the work, you have to do the work, you have to be paid for the work. Yeah. Yeah. If you screw up any of those, you're out of business, right? Getting paid for the work is sometimes the, the hardest. hardest. The real hardest. It's the hardest. And, and I hear so many people of our friends here telling stories about how they're outstanding for so many you know, and it's like not to put any companies out there, but you're like, holy cow, mm -hmm. what is going on right now? You know, so you gotta be very careful on how you hunt for the work. I, I'm curious with the people on the panel here. Yeah. Um, I've been lucky enough where I've usually 
because when I work freelance, I get people, I get them to pay like half up front. Mm -hmm. Is that a typical thing or no? Um, I've had it where like upon first draft, I get half. And then upon okay. my um, final draft with edits done is the final payment. Yeah, okay. I mean, I'm usually sure. half on outline, like I get an improved outline. Right. Yep. Get that's yeah. to that point. Yeah. Then half it when you're done. Sometimes I'll want to do it in thirds and we'll say third mm -hmm. on publication. Like, no, guy yeah, no, no, no. Don't, don't do it on publication. Yeah. Never no. publication. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, because projects fall apart. Right. Yep. right. Mm -hmm. First, things have nothing to do with you. The business could just fall over. Yeah. They could decide that this is something you want to pursue. Suddenly you're Paper on skyrockets. So if they actually, if they like, insist on doing it that way, I will say, look, okay, we'll let you. Go until we say that's the date that you have to pay me on this date, whether you publish or not. Yep. I usually do a little bit of a scale when I'm designing for other companies and they hire us on to do core game design mainly because the writing isn't, we don't get paid by word, we get paid by royalty per, per unit sold. And we do projected on print run and stuff. And usually, uh, depending on the size of the company and what they can and cannot do for cash flow, uh, we'll do it multiple ways. I can say if you give me half of what that projected print run is <coughs> up front, I'll give you a bit of a deal. I'll make it a little easier for you because you get a lot more cash in front, and they, that's my piece of famine responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, but if they, if that cash, if those big chunks of money are a little harder for a company, so they're a smaller company and I really want to work on the property or whatnot, we'll do sliding scales. So we'll do like quarters at various milestones, and each milestone is like a hostage scenario. Mm -hmm. um, and then sometimes, <laughs> sometimes like for companies that I'm working for, like for BattleTech, for example, I have an ongoing position where we're going to be developing the AI system for uh, like thousands of mechs over the course of the next like two, three years for the 40th anniversary. And it's gonna be a very long, multi-box, multi-project process. So we do a, a heavy projection as to where we're gonna go. And then we amortize that so that I'm getting sort of, uh, almost like I'm on payroll, getting a monthly stipend to keep the fresh work going because we're gonna be doing sort of organized play kind of stuff. So a combination of some, some st stable stipend, uh, you know, large, I've taken, Canadian, taken down the moose as a wolf, right? <laughs> I've got the big chunk of meat to eat. Um, and, and, and other various methods, but it's a sliding scale and you can negotiate with the company based on finding out what their cash flow needs are and what your cash flow needs are, and then kind of work within that, that, uh, that scale. So I'm always sliding it around. This reminds me of a really important topic, which is working with other companies, is communication. Yeah. Constant communication and understanding yes, of what they're thinking, what you're thinking, right? And read so, your contract. Yeah. Because get, it will tell contract. you how you will get paid. I got a contract. Get my God. You no, know you're getting paid. <laughs> no Terminator. Out, when Same. you expect it, all that. Right? Yeah. What was that about Terminator? For Terminator Genesis, I got burned for a contract hard. Luckily, yeah. that company's gone. But, yeah. um, company oh, you said got, Terminator because I did the Terminator RPG for Nightfall. Oh, did you? Yeah, so we right. did Terminator Genesis, the board game. Right, okay. For Alex Studios. And, um, they they said they sent us this like a contract mm -hmm. and uh, I not like I look at the stuff and it's like Bruh. I can't see <laughs> I don't understand legalese it's like hieroglyphics to me and so you, know, you get professionals to look at it and one of the thing one of the loopholes we missed on it that burned us hard was that uh, we only got paid royalties on the games that were sold uh, from North America but they're they're a European company. Oh, oh. so so they sell wholesale to a distributor in Europe who then sells to a distributor in North America. The original sale was in Europe. We get nothing. Oh. Now, luckily, 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 uh, they bombed because they suck, and <laughs> the game only printed two or three thousand copies, and or maybe five thousand at max was spread out across the world. We did get an advance, so if you do the math, we kind of did get, we got about 40% we of what we were owed for the project. It was Terminator Genesis, so it was a good project. It is one of the highest rating games for, uh, what we've designed on Board Game Geek, it's huge. And there's a massive cult fan base for it right now, um, to the point where we, uh, we also, in the contract, the rights revert, so we now have the rights to the mechanics again, so we're gonna go and re-release it. Uh, maybe not as Terminator, but as something else. So we got at least we got that mechanic, which we're going to use the rabbit fan base to try and scrape yeah. back some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. But you got to be very careful because that one little loop screwed yeah. us. You know, and that happens. Like it's probably happening here. Like it happens. You know oh, what I mean? Like you got to be yep. very careful. It's great yeah. to understand those options. Like whether you can do something like the rights will revert to me. Like sometimes people pay you for. Like Ian World does a thing where they'll pay you. And after a certain amount of time, you get the material back and you can sell it however you want. It's kind of yep. cool, right? If you want to start into self-publishing, that can be a way to do it. Yep. 
We didn't pay overall, but it might work for you, and it, you know, flexible. I don't want to dominate, but I just want to tell this last story, then, and I won't talk again for the rest of the panel. <laughs> um, so we have a project coming up, Evil Dead 2, the board game. It has had a long, arduous path uh, from the first company having the rights, getting a $750,000 Kickstarter, and then bankrupting. Uh, we worked with the company in Jasco to bring the rights back. Uh, the licensor gave the rights. We designed for free. The publisher published for free. And we did a, a heartthrob Kickstarter to bring all that back uh, and give every back of their game, which built a great community. Uh, and then Jasco got bought and, and was dissolved. And all of the, the game's rights that we worked for them, Buffy, uh, Evil Dead, Darkstalkers, Street Fighter, uh, all that stuff, all came back to us. So we, we got all these designs back. And now all these other publishers that we know are picking up those licenses and coming to us to reprint those games. We actually went out and financially crippled ourselves to get the license for Evil Dead 2, so now we have the license. So we're gonna present the game now, and this is gonna be our first real big license project out there to try and, and get Evil Dead 2 out there, which ironically is coming out at the same time. A game we designed four years ago is coming out, which is Army of Darkness, but we don't have the rights to Army of Darkness, but we designed the games, so it's coming out at the same time. So. Uh, you know, the rights are a big discussion, and if you're going to get involved in licensed IP and stuff, that's a whole other break. Who, who did you get the rights for Evil Dead 2 from? Studio Canal. Studio Canal has it? Okay. No, because <clears throat> it's one of those licenses where the first I movie... I to do it with us, and they won't. <laughs> <laughs> so let's have a conversation about that, because we'll, we'll, we'll just do it. <laughs> yeah, but the first movie, the third, and fourth movie are different license holders than the second movie. Owns. And the same thing with Terminator, it's like half the movies are different. Yeah, everything Star Trek, they're all different. split up. Everybody owns everything, and no one wants to play in the same Speaking, same speaking of this connection thing that you're seeing here, um, <laughs> one of the things that's really cool about this hobby is that people will help you rise, yeah. and mm -hmm. you should do the same. Yes. And those people you help rise will eventually employ you, which is really fun, actually. It's mm -hmm. like really neat when they do that. You know, when they're like, I actually have work, would we you want to do back. this? It's so neat. Yeah. Sure, so, we have a question in the back. I have a question. We, you talked about how, like, don't do it if you're bad at it. Um, and so I wondered, especially, particularly about editing, what would you recommend and how to improve before you go out and try to get that first stuff? Oh, uh, yeah. Stroke and wipe. Uh, elements of style, AP Strunk and White is the basic book ready. <laughs> Study the Chicago Manual, AP style. Uh, usually it's AP style or the Chicago Manual style yep. that are used for editors. If you just study those and learn those, Strunk and White's a great one just as a primer, right? That's one we all get in high school, at least we did when I was a kid. So. Um, and you can teach yourself this stuff. Actually, I got a game, at game uh, I got a job at Games Workshop when I was fresh out of college. Went over to England on a student work visa and didn't know anybody in the entire hemisphere except one kid in Spain. And knocked on their door and said, hey, give me a job. And they're like, uh, sure, you know, uh, take this editing test. And of course, you know, proper British editing works. Yeah. This is back before we actually, we didn't have Macintoshes yet, right? So we're actually at uh, Linotype typesetters. You had to do red marks on so the typesetter were good. I'm like, yes, I know that. No fucking clue, right? But I, I <clears> go back to London from Nottingham, go to a bookstore, get a Queen's English Dictionary that has editing marks in the back, teach mm -hmm. myself what I need to know, take the test, show up on Monday morning with everything out on my back in two duffel bags and say, either need to give me a job today or my dad's best friend's boss's daughter, who I've never met but lives in Oxford, will give me a couch to sleep on for a couple of weeks while I find a bartending game. <laughs> and he said, sure, come on in. So, right? Fellowship in two hours. Got yeah. so many stories that I want to hear. That's a good one. But yeah, I, so you can teach yourself these things. I mean, there's a lot of online resources for this kind of stuff nowadays, too. I mean, even just running your stuff through Grammarly or through even Microsoft Word, see where it goes squiggly and say, why is that wrong? Right? Or, control, or Control Z. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of different ways you can teach yourself to these skills. If, you, or if you're about that, the big thing I got out of the liberal arts degree in college was learning how to teach myself stuff, right? So when I, like I've written uh, a couple editions of Marvel Encyclopedia, I write a lot of nonfiction stuff as well, because I can go out and learn these things, right? Even if you don't have a, a passion for them, and I happen to for Marvel, but uh, you can go teach yourself these things, and it's not that hard. If you actually enjoy learning, you can figure these things out. Um, yes, so I so I am a primarily an adventure writer and developer and product lead now, but I definitely broke in with my professional editing credentials because that's what it said on my business card way right. back in 2009 when I was trying to get freelance jobs. Um, so I would really encourage you to look at specific companies that you would like to work for. And if it's possible to suss out whether they're actually using freelance editors right now, 
that's also ideal. Um, and the best way to do that is just straight up look on their website. Sometimes it will say, but also mm -hmm. just ask around, ask around to other people who are doing freelance editing. Most tabletop RPG companies, and I hesitate to say all, because I think there's a couple exceptions uh, who've got people on staff, but almost everybody uses freelance editors. Wizards of the Coast uses freelance editors. I had two on the book that just came out a couple of weeks ago and they were wonderful. Um, so look at the specific company and see what styles they, they use. So uh, Wizards, we default to Chicago Manual of Style. We also have a very extensive in-house style guide um, in which we, we do and we have certain editorial standards that are unique to our company, which is very fun. Um, it was much more work switching over from Cobalt Press, which is where I was before, over to Wizards because a lot of stuff is done completely the opposite, uh, as well as from Paizo, which is where I was at for five years before that. Um, so just being aware of, of what they do and asking, finding out who's their managing editor, if you're able to make that connection and say, hey, is there an internal style guide that we can look at? Um, editing tests are a thing at every company I've worked for. Um, Wizards, we have an editing test that people take to get into the pool. Um, it's very difficult. Uh, several people um, have not, unfortunately, been able to make it past that, but it does use Chicago Manual of Style. It uses all of our in-house style guides, and there's uh, an extent, there are extensive mechanic sections as well as narrative and adventure sections to show that you know header hierarchy and um, you know rules presentation information and terminology. It's a yeah. lot. <laughs> it's a lot, but it's stuff that you can learn. Editors make your stuff enough. look pretty. It's stuff that doesn't change. You just said like 80 words I've never heard. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we, we, we are insane, honestly, uh, all of us. <laughs> Some, something important about this editor thing also. Um, you want to be a team player and you want to, like as the editor, you want to help the writers or the book designer or, or whatever find, <clears throat> find the voice they're looking for. You're not trying to put your own voice in there. Um, I had, we hired an editor, I was creative director and uh, lead writer on a project and my game designer is my writing partner who's written a million books with me. And the editor who we hired, because we're like, this is great, this guy will help organize everything and everything. I guess he didn't understand that this guy was my, the, the designer was my best buddy and we'd worked on all these things because he tried to turn us against each other. Mm -hmm. Like, oh. he, what? yeah, and I mean, he would. There he would, has been and, stuff like this. Yeah, yeah, and I'm like, what are you Ooh, trying drama. to do, man? What are you yeah. trying to do? And it's like, you know, we just, we, we got through it and he's called me every month for more work and I never pick up the phone. Yep. So, yeah. you know, I'm not, not playing that game. It's, it's what's just, nice about freelance, right? You yeah. can just ignore people if you don't want to yeah, take absolutely. a job. Absolutely. <laughs> it's great. Uh, this guy's got his hand so, up forever. So. so, I don't know the correct like, way to put this, but you guys are like micro selections, right? So <laughs> <laughs> I, I call myself nerd famous. famous. <laughs> My friends all say <laughs> I'm nerd famous. famous. And when we go to cons, right, and you say you're trying, and it feels like you have to meet people and I was wondering what you guys like, what's your guys, I don't know, what do you guys want to see from people who are coming up? Because I don't want to ever come up to somebody who I know is like in the industry and just be like, hey, hey, how's it going? You know what I mean? I don't know how to approach that situation. I don't want you to hand me a manuscript. No. Yes. Because I probably can't look at it. <laughs> I want to approach the situation like a human and not like yeah. you guys so, are people yeah. I So, yeah. Show you, show, be cool, show, you know. Be like, professional. Share, share your knowledge. Yeah. Wow us with, with Bring your a personality. <laughs> You know, and then it's like, hey, you know, I need a guy. Hey, you know what? That guy liked that thing I met at that bar. Maybe I should call him. You yeah. know, it's it's not that you're not going to walk out of there with a job, probably. Yeah, okay, right. but the thing is, is that you 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 become a cool guy who I see at several cons. I'm going to mm -hmm. think, hey, when I have a slot open, maybe I should try him. Uh, yeah. And it's not just cons, right? Like it doesn't have conventions can be expensive. You yeah. know, they they can be time consuming. There are a lot of ways online to get to know people. But the more that you that it's easy to find what you're doing. That will help you, right? If you have a blog where you're constantly pulling out cool stuff, if you have a couple of adventures that you've written or whatever it is that you like designing, if you have examples of those, right, art, layout, whatever, then it's really easy that if I ever go to check out your stuff, I'm like, oh yeah, that was cool, mm -hmm. right? And then yeah. when we talk, it makes so much more sense and then so that's better. The thing people forget too is you meet somebody at a convention, and we meet a lot of people at conventions, you meet a lot of people, right? Yeah. It's a blur. Yep. Right? Yep. So follow up with an email. Yep. Uh, yes. 
uh, like Twitter three days later, say not like, like right I mean, after. Yeah, exactly. I always Green say, Twitter, remind me what we talked about. Like, send an email yeah. and say, hi, I met you at this place and we talked about X. Right. And yeah. then I'll go, oh, yeah, it was that person. But, and have a business card if you can. And on your Facebook or whatever social media you use, have a picture of you. <clears> yes. Not, <laughs> some, not, not, a, not, not a picture, not a picture <laughs> or something. <laughs> because these people, people come up to me and they're talking to me and I'm like... I don't know who you are. I've never seen your face before. And they're like, what? It's so-and-so. I'm like, the Pikachu? You're the Pikachu. I don't remember meeting Pikachu. Uh, persistence is a big thing, yep. Yeah. Uh, being, being there a lot is a you know, constant... It's like a commercial, you need to constantly be shown over and over again before I'm like, I, I really do want that hamburger now. Like, you know, <laughs> so for that perseverance is a big deal uh, to do that. And, you know, it doesn't hurt to have, uh, don't do not do anything kitschy that's going to like, you know, don't give me like uh, a business card that is like this tiny little thing because it's going to make it different than a regular looking business card. I'll so lose I'm, it in my purse. It's going to be gone. Like. Just go basic sometimes. Like, just basic and clean and professional is really easy to do. Uh, I've gone the opposite route with a bit of a showboaty. I wear this yellow leather jacket that, like, is kind of like a rock star on the field. The field. People are like, this is Banana Man again. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I, look like, I look like a Pokemon trainer from Ikea, because walking around. Is like, but this is a result of some of the publishers that I've worked with that are just like, you know, you advertise yourself like a rock star, so act like a rock star. So I walked up, it's Brian Kinsella from, uh, from WizKids, and I walked up with a leather, yellow leather jacket with my symbol on the back, like I'm some sort of gang member, and he just goes, yeah, we're <laughs> so you gotta be careful. So now, Eric, so the yellow jacket's a good thing for me because when I'm walking around, either people who want to talk to me know exactly where to find me. And if you want to avoid me, you know exactly how to avoid me. And I think either way, I win. So, it's like, <laughs> so, so uh, you know, just just find find something that's you, and then really the jackets and the business cards. It's it's that's just the neon sneakers. Yeah. Yellow yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, the jacket, the business cards. It's all just that's a, that's just like kind of an entry point. Really comes down to a couple of factors: the quality of your work, which is going to be which what gets noticed, and beyond that, even like your work doesn't even have to be exemplary. Your integrity, mm -hmm. uh, integrity and honesty with yourself mm -hmm. is going to be the thing. Like, hey, I actually don't know how to do this yes. as effective as you might like, but I really would like to learn how to, yeah. and I'm going to get better at it. Here's my work. That was me, my first couple of writing. I was right? very upfront. I'm like, I have no idea how to do this. Please but give like me direction and I will take it and run with it. That's that willingness to learn. You don't have to aim at our level or above or around. Working with folks that are at your level <clears throat> can really be great. Like Absolutely. A network of friends that are like you is super helpful and you rise together, helping each other out, learning things, exchanging tips. That's really awesome. It's sometimes better. We need to clear out. Okay. Thank you, everybody. This will be on Dr. Day's radio for the recording.